design. And then you say as we design, you'll come up with all the releases. And if you click on them, you can get more details. <clears throat> we do have new features added to the software and I'm excited to have a demo with one of these later in the presentation. Please feel free to ask questions or submit a chat message to us. But we'll go ahead and get started. I hope everybody's well during this COVID time, but Pat. Pat, you got muted. Hold on, let me, okay, go ahead, Pat. Oh, there you go. You're, you're unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> So with COVID-19, there were several new funds added by the Auditor of State. In May on the 7.42 release, the 507 fund was added, and this was the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, often referred to ESER. Also in the same release, the 508 fund was added, and this is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, often referred to as GER. G-E-E-R. In June, on the 7.43 release, the 509 fund was added, and that's Title IV, Part B, 21st Century. And on the, in July, the 7.46 release added this 510 fund, which is the Corona's Relief Fund. I have added the CFDA numbers there for convenience. If any other funds become available, we'll let you know, and we will also uh, add them to the redesign. So when they are creating the new fund, some of the fields that get automatically populated can be modified. I'm gonna go down to the 500. And I'll show you the fields that are automatically populated. Oops, sorry. So when you're adding it, if you leave the description blank, it'll populate with the auditor of state account number. It'll populate the fund type. It will check mark the active. It requires budgeting and the include certificate, but those can be modified. So another update that we had was this requires budgeting flag. It was there, but it wasn't previously implemented. So now this will allow districts to override balancing checking at the fund level, like how in classic the bypass budgeting flag and how that worked. However, because of the wording, it does work a little bit differently, like almost oppositely. In classic, when the classic flag was set to true, that meant to ignore the budgeting and allow transactions to post even if the account was negative. In redesign, if this is checkmarked, it will require budgeting and it won't let transactions to post if the account balance will be negative. Another uh, update regarding accounts is the hotfix 8.0.1, and that's regarding um, this mass add. Instead of getting an error, when this is more of an enhancement because when the user uses the mass add option under the cash account, Instead of giving, getting an error and the account's not being created, if there was like an invalid account, now the process will continue on and create all valid accounts with an error message that includes the accounts that could not be created with a reason why it could not be created. So then the user can manually create the accounts that were not created by this process or use the mass load option on the utilities menu. 
And I do have a screenshot of the errors. So you will see it, it'll, it, it mass added all the appropriate accounts except for like this one where it said error and it was because of not a valid function code. Another update in regards to accounts was in regards to this account grid. On the 7.39 release in April, it improved the performance with the grid loading. Before, if it took 10 seconds, now it should only take like one second. So the data retrieval improved like 90%. Also another uh, improvement with performance was the account sync process between USPS and USAS. That increased in performance by 83%. So it was previously running like 12 minutes for one district and now it's only running two minutes. So you may also may have noticed the release versions changed to an 8.0 and this was because the new accounts receivable module is considered a major update. So to use this, first you'll want to go to the documentation in the USAS manual for details on how to import your existing ARF customers and transactions and how to balance. But once you do that and you enable the module, you will see this tab up here and it becomes available. We did have a Fridays with Fiscal July 31st training it was recorded and it can be found on the trainings and registration page. And it's about an hour and 15 minutes. So just so you know, you can still submit the accounts receivable uh, issues, problems, or enhancements through the same USASC uh, help desk. There was another correction in a recent hotfix that included permissions related to transactions that are impacted by both USAS and accounts receivable. And this was in regards to uh, USAS read-only rule. So I am going to log into a USAS read-only user. Charles. And you will see the USAS read-only user does not have permission to view the uh, accounts receivable tab. So this will prevent users that don't have AR permissions or the AR role from deleting or modifying USAS transactions that were generated by the AR transaction or the AR user. So for example, Charles can view receipts because in this receipt grid, it will populate all the receipts from both AR and USAS. And let me see the receipt. I view this receipt. I had an example, I apologize, but this user, if this receipt was created by the AR person, he would not, this would all be grayed out. So he would not be able to edit, clone, or reverse. However, his, his receipt that he may have um, posted, he'll be able to do. So this means that if a user needs to avoid a refund generated by the AR payments, they'll need some more permissions. They'll need the disbursement permission and the AR credit permission. There was a rule update regarding requisitions. 
This rule is disabled by default and is not mandatory. So if the district chooses this rule, it can be enabled to produce an error telling the user that, that the requisition date cannot be before the current date. But just so you know what the rule looks like. If you enable this, I already have it set for true. So then when I go to enter a requisition, and my current period is July, so I'll have to change it to June. Now it'll give you the error, requisition date cannot be before current date. So if you're, the district chooses to use that, they can set that to true. Another update was in regards to vendors. This was on the 7.39 release. So when you're adding vendors, you can now add the, the US territories. So now the US territories is added to the valid list of state abbreviations like Guam, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. So the, these codes can now be used without getting an error. Also, there was a vendor tax ID configuration rule that was updated with the same release. So now users will no longer receive warnings about the tax ID being required for the vendor when the user goes to modify a disbursement. So when you're modifying disbursement, it had nothing to do with the vendor's tax ID, so we remove that. So regarding some disbursement updates, I'm gonna go into AP invoices. And this was an update to the AP invoices to prevent modifying the vendor number when posting invoices. The change was specific to non multi vendor purchase orders in which the vendor should not change. So if I was to go and invoice this purchase order. You will see I can't even change it. There's no option. And that's how it's intended to work. You can only change a multi-vendor purchase order. Oops, I should have stayed on there. Another enhancement was in regards to this inventory item flag, the EIS flag, prior to this 7.44 release. If you filled all items, it would check mark these flags. But it, if you did it individually, it was not doing that. So now that's been corrected. So either way you're doing it, it will, if it's filled, it'll check mark that flag as it's intended to work. There was also a disbursement account balancing rule that was updated regarding reconciling disbursements. So prior to the 7.4 release, users were receiving a negative cash balance warning when they were reconciling their disbursements. If there was a negative balance on the associated cash account. This warning was only in the pop-up warning. I can't show you because it's been corrected. But even though the pop-up warning message was there, it was not updating the totals on the cash account. So since that was confusing, the warning is now not being shown. There was also a warning when reconciling memo checks when districts were re reconciling those as part of the post import procedures. And that has been corrected.
There was also a release version 7.42 that updated invoice items that had previously been entered with a blank receive date. So that patch was created to populate the receive date to the value of the vendor's invoice date if that was populated. So I am going to show So you see, I'll make that darker. So this vendor invoice date was not entered by the user. So the receive date down here was populated by that date with that release. So the change password link is now working again. And I'm that's either like here or under utilities. Users will get a, a error message when they enter the wrong old password. So we've seen this a few times with districts and it's basically the user is putting in the wrong old password and then getting severe bad credentials. So just so you're aware of that, if they get that, just make sure they remember their old password. So another enhancement was if you have a district that wants one district member responsible for change in passwords, but the district doesn't want that user to be able to add, edit, or delete user accounts. It is now pack, uh, possible with the new password role. So first I had to go to my roles and I set up this password creator with the roles of USAS user password and USAS user view. Then I went to my user, Jane Doe, and assigned her the password creator role. So if I log into her, You see she has less options, but she can still access users. She can only change passwords and she can only view the user. If you want them to be able to add, edit, and delete, as well as change passwords, the USAS user update permission would need to be added. So we also added this tip to the FAQ section in the appendix for reference. So now a new feature that I'm excited about to demo, and it's to post receipts and reduction of expenditure transactions with the CSV file. This was in the version 8.0 release. The USAS standard role will be able to utilize this import function or any user with the permission to create receipts. Any rule that the district has set up pertaining to receipts will also be applied when importing this uh, CSV spreadsheet as well. We also wanted to show you the receipt chapter in the manual. And then we have a new section, import receipts. We have the receipt import criteria here. And really there are only four required fields for your spreadsheet. 
It can be in any order, but they've got to require at least these four. However, we made it easy and we have included a spreadsheet with all these formats already formatted for you. So if you would just download that, you can take this spreadsheet and just fill in your data or have the district fill in the data and then use, use it. So I already have a spreadsheet already populated. I have a parent volunteer fingerprinting receipt, July interest, a foundation ODE payment with three lines, and a refund for Pam Bird. If I leave all the receipt numbers blank, it will auto assign the receipt number. And the key, remember I said these columns can be in any order. The key is each new receipt must start with a one. So this is a new receipt. The system knows that that's a new receipt when it's assigning a receipt number. Then it gets to the foundation payment and this receipt has three lines. So that'll be the same, the system will know that it's the same receipt and then it'll know that this is the new one to be assigned a new number. So that's the key. And I am gonna take that spreadsheet and show you how it works. Again, you'll go to transaction receipts and that's where I'm sitting here. You'll click in import, choose your file. And click load. You'll have a little message box up here where it says records loaded three, errors one. So you go down to the file that downloaded to find out your error. The error will be listed here and it says it's invalid account type for the item type. So you see, I have a reduction of expenditure. However, I have a receipt count here. So for a reduction of expenditure, I must have an expenditure account. So if I update that to the correct Full account number. Save it. Go back to my USAS. First, I was going to show you. Those three receipts did come in, the parent volunteer, the interest, and the foundation. And the foundation looked, has three lines like it was intended. And now I wanna import that corrected spreadsheet with the one item on it. And now that worked, records loaded, one errors, no. It did give me another file, but it's no errors, records loaded, one. So that's a big time saver. And then there's the refund for Pam Bird that populated. So the reason why I like it is because it was that easy and it's a great time saver for districts. So we just kind of talked about an error. So now I wanted to show you a new section in the manual that we created under the appendix. And it's the USAS R error messages with different categories. So if you got an error when you're doing a receipt, and it says that, it'll tell you the explanation, what that error means. So we have this 
linked to the message below. So if you're doing vendors, you can go there for your error section. So that's been kind of handy. Check that out when you come across an error. Another miscellaneous update was the online checkbook. The generate and submit button was added to allow districts to auto send the file directly to the treasurer of state instead of manually updating the file. This was updated in the 7.4 release. The system will display an informational message stating that the file was sent successfully. And the file name includes the IRN, the file created date and time. There is a bug that is in the file that's been created and it's in the file prior to sending it to the state and it has to do with special characters. So if you have a vendor in there that has like an at sign like at home or an and sign like Tom and Jerry or something like that as the vendor it is not picking up those special characters. Are there any questions so far? Okay, I'm going to go to the report grid. On the 7.45 release, we prevented users from accidentally importing a USPS report definition into the USAS application and vice versa. So a user can't accidentally import a USPS report definition now. On the 7.43 release, we added the PO number on the SSDT post import closed purchase orders with the remaining balance report. This will help ITCs assist um, with the post import balancing. And I do have a screenshot of that report. So this report will now give you not only just the purchase order number, but the item number, which will be very handy. On the 7.38 release, the user parameters will now be cleared when switching between report runs. Before, some parameters hung around, so when users went to run a new report, they had to click on the default report to kind of like eliminate any hanging, any parameters that might, may have hung around. So that's been uh, eliminated now. What release did you say that was included in? 7.38. Thank you. You're welcome. Also on that same release, a report improvement was made to include the district's name and date range in the report header for both the template and the canned reports. So now when you're generating reports, you should see the organization name in the header. I'm going to run a cash summary for my 006 total as of period July. So if I enter a July, any July date, in this total as of period, it'll just give me as of July. And then I'm going to exclude accounts with zero amounts. But then when I go over to my sort options, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. So now you will see the as of period here and the, the name of the district. If you run that same report and you click 
the show report options. It will have the total as of period up here. So it won't be printed down here like it was in the previous report. It's not going to be redundant. Also with this, there was a hot fix that um, was made because the district's name was being pulled from the core organization page and the USAS standard user did not have permission to view this. So it wasn't, it was stopping all cron jobs from running, but that has been corrected too. It had something to do with the permission. Columns widths on like the budget summary were increased to help prevent data wrapping for large districts or large amounts. And the report bundle for fiscal year end was created. This is to replace the classic fiscal CD and it can be found under the utilities file archive. You click on the line, it'll show you all the reports that are included. So now I'm going to show you what I was jumping ahead to earlier. I'm going to open up the SSDT budget summary. I'm going to query my options to be a fund 001. I'm going to add a function of 1100. Total as of July. And then on my sort options, there's a new field that has been added. Uh, they added that forecast line to be a sortable property to assist districts with generating reports. So under the sort options, you will see the forecast line that you can click and drag over. I'm going to do a control break and I'm also going to drag over the object one digit. I'll generate that and I'll show you what So now if districts want the forecast line, there's the personal services, the benefits, and then the purchase services. So that's kind of handy if that's something that they're looking to use. That might be handy with the revenue summary, the financial detail, the budget account activity. So I will conclude with some performance updates, which are always ongoing. Uh, in March, there was a performance update to improve promoting budget scenarios. So the system no longer gets stuck or hung up if there was an error. In April, they improved the performance of the appropriation resolution report by 99%. In May, they improved the posting purchase orders from pending transactions. Now this kind of depends on the various transactions, rules, and permissions, but generally the performance improved 57 to 70%. And then in May, the financial detail performance was improved 95, 94%. And in August, with the 8.0, the revenue and expenditure report was improved. I am going to show you where you can find these release notes. So on the wiki page, oops, sorry.
you can keep up to date. But since we've met in March, it's these that have been all improved. So you can come here and get an update anytime you'd like. That is all that I have for you, SAS. Does anybody have any questions? Pat, there is one question from the chat. Could you go back to um, show those report parameters again? Um, I think for I think it was for the forecast line. Someone just wanted to take a screenshot. Oh, sure. Is this the right one? Or do you want me to run the report? I think this was it. Um, so yeah, so Tammy requested it. So Tammy, if there, if this isn't it, um, or if you want us to run the report, just let us know. Okay, thank you. Have a good weekend and I'll switch over to USPS for their release information. In the meantime, stretch, get a cup of coffee and we'll start in like five minutes. Thank you. Can you see my screen, Pat? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. I was scared you didn't answer. I'm like, oh my gosh, where did my volume go? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and start the second portion of the Fridays with Fisco, the update releases, and this will be for the payroll portion. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start to, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about, we had a few, uh, well, more than a few, but we had some bug fixes that were added and, and done during this time, and we're going to be going over anything that was done from the 6101 release through the 620 release, which is the release that will be coming out today. So um, we'll just kind of go over a few of the bug fixes that were, were corrected or fixed, and then we're going to talk about the improvements and the new features that were added. So uh, as far as the bug fixes, uh, one bug that was fixed was when, there were, when you were importing from Classic, uh, there was a failure to import absences that had uh, employee ID with an apostrophe. So we corrected that. And another thing that we did as well was there was a lot of problems with the uh, USAS account synchronization button. And when people would click on it, they didn't see the progress, the things that it was doing behind the scenes. And so they would click it and click it again. Well, we fixed that to disable that button. So once you click it, it's automatically doing its process, but you can't keep clicking on it because when you were clicking on it multiple times, it would uh, cause performance issues, and it also could possibly lock the user out. So they basically fixed that. Um, they corrected the last pay date being returned to the SOAP service. Um, there's a get last pay date method that searches the pay history to find when the last time paid was, and then that it will now return that to the employee record. Uh, they changed how the account cha uh, charging is validated in the system. So that will be uh, corrected now. So the validation of the external ID and active flag will be checked 
and then the position pay object is created. So basically it uses that information to uh, validate the payroll account information. Um, another big issue that we noticed or we had was the outstanding payables reports were not going out to the file archive. That has now been fixed. So the, all the outstanding payables reports should be out in the file archive. Um, a pre previously, a change was made in the system um, when the system generates pay types. So basically, when the pay initialization is done, those pay types are pulled into current. Well, they made a change that would not allow any, any manual changes to be made to those entries in current. Um, that has been fixed. That restriction was lifted because we had several people say, hey, we want to be able to make changes to those pay, that pay information. So that was uh, corrected and you can now make changes on that record in current. Um, we had, uh, there was a bug that was uh, introduced and on the 612 release and it caused some performance problems. So they fixed that um, on 612.1. And what, what they fixed was basically the, the runtime for the pay report, the budget distribution report, the pay account detail report, the pay summary report, the pay item detail report, the posting of the payroll and unposting of payroll. So basically those were all enhanced to make them uh, faster. Um, we fixed a query related to the payroll item max amount. There were some problems with that, they fixed that. Um, there was a there wasn't a bug that was introduced and it was fixed on 6122 um, regarding the HSA submission file. The bug basically would uh, not allow the file to complete, so they fixed that problem. A bug fix was process or uh, done on 6123 regarding uh, the payroll item specific date max type. Um, it was still being paid after the max was met, so they corrected that, so it would no longer uh, pay that uh, payroll item after that max had been met. Um, the leave projection, uh, when converting expenditure accounts, it was not including all of the properties of the account, so this caused issues later on in the report. Um, so now it, that has been corrected, so it will no longer you know, error out or cause a problem. On the 613 release, uh, the uh, bug was in uh, the position import from Classic to handle the FTE. So basically, uh, earlier the FTE, if it was null, it was causing a problem. Um, so the importer wouldn't import anything. So they corrected that to fix the, the position importer to check the FTE values prior to saving. And so if the value is now, if it's null, it's gonna assume zero. And then if the value is greater than one, it's just going to assume one. Uh, another fix was on the uh, employee importer from Classic. It wasn't handling a null phone number when there was an extension number provided. So if a work phone number was null and an extension you know, was, uh, in there or on the record. Um, it was setting the phone number to null X1111 or whatever the extension number was that they had on there. So they updated that to check for the, uh, the null phone number before adding it uh, to the string. Another bug that was fixed, uh, the system was allowing HSA uh, to uh, have negative or zero amounts on the submission file. That was corrected. And they also fixed the bug in the ODGFS report that was not including imported adjustment journal entries. So that was corrected. Um, another one that we fixed was um, on the employer distribution. When the pay cycle was used, uh, it was causing issues. So when they selected the pay cycle and they ran the employer distribution report, um, now it will include the pay arrives that have a configuration set up with that selected payroll pay cycle. Before it wasn't doing that, it was causing a problem. So both the report and the setup screen are um, set up so that if no pay cycle or payroll item is selected, 
no data is going to be on the preview, which makes sense. If you have nothing selected, like what you're looking for as far as payroll item or a pay cycle, it's not going to give you anything. You have to either select a cycle or the payroll item or a combination of the both. And then um, this will you know, give you data on your report. They fixed a bug that, uh, on the payroll posting that was not stamping the attendance entries correctly. So that has been fixed. Uh, the uh, SSCT account history version two report uh, was corrected. Uh, it's, uh, now it's going to look at the specific pay accounts and stamp them in with historical pay position and historical pay amounts before it was not looking for all of that data for the specific pay accounts it was only pulling in the regular pay accounts so that has been corrected uh, there was a bug that was preventing outstanding payables from posting if a column filter was used and payables were paid by payee so that has been fixed um, an invalid email address was causing employee import from Classic um, to be imported as archive. Uh, basically, the employee to import contains the email address field and it failed. Uh, so it was not saving the information correctly and it included it as concealed. So they, the update fixed that problem. Um, they also fixed the bug on 615.1. Uh, with the HSA processing, it was uh, including non-electronic payments in the ACH file. So basically, if they had, you know, some, maybe they, they use H HSA electronic payment for everyone, but maybe they have like a superintendent or somebody that does not get electronically transferred because they want to, you know, give him a, or, or process a check for that instead. It was actually including that in the, in the HSA submission file. So that issue has been corrected. Uh, we also fixed the upper limits or the, the amount of uh, CC records or hours per week, I'm sorry, on the EMIS CC records. Uh, previously, it was only set at 167. So we, we changed that to 9,999.99. So now it should not have a problem with entering um, the hours per week. Um, what else did we do here? Uh, we fixed the bug in the SRS uh, non-advance report, which was not including manual compensation adjustments for contract days work. So that was corrected as well. Um, let's see here what else we did. We fixed the problem with outstanding payables that was marking payables as processed, even if the amounts were not included in a check. Uh, so basically the user, the user utilized the pay cycle option, the internal query that decides which payables were to be set as posted, did not always take that into consider, consideration. So they corrected that problem. So now um, basically if you have a, a payee that is set to be paid um, monthly or quarterly or whatever, um, it will now correct that and it will now include that on, the, on a check when they process it at the, at the proper time. Uh, we did an improvement on the employee master report. Um, it was causing issues for large districts because it's such a large report. It was very, very slow. So they, they corrected that. Um, we fixed an, a bug with the benefit obligation report. Uh, the zero balance filter was not working on the report. So basically it's including or- Where are you guys going? Hold on here. We have to mute. That's Can you, uh, I'll just go ahead and mute everybody. There we go. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, where are we at? Oh, yeah. We fixed the bug. Or you muted yourself. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Let's go back. Yeah, I just got a message saying I was muted. So um, let me go over that one again. So we fixed a bug in the benefit obligation report, which was uh, supposed to zero uh, balance or filter out any zero balance employees. It wasn't doing that. 
So we corrected it. So now on that report, the empl any employees with zero balance that should not be appearing on that report. Um, we also fixed the bug during the payroll posting, which was incorrectly adding the last paid accrued and, let and payoff accrued to the compensation amounts. It shouldn't have been doing that. We fixed that. And then we also corrected an issue um, when, we're, when you do the convert personal to sick leave, the issue D, which basically will take what leave one personal day and then convert the remaining to sick was not set up correctly in redesign like it is like it wasn't it wasn't working like it does in classic. So we corrected that to match how the behavior in classic works. Um, we fixed the SRS advanced withholding calculation. Uh, they were not correctly including DAC amounts when in uh, trying to go into the SRS advanced. So if an employee was docked using a dock pay type, the amount of the dock was not being included in the gross used for the calculating of the advance amount, and it should be doing that. So we corrected that. <clears throat> oh, hold on, I gotta turn my page here. I can turn it. Um, we fixed the bug that was preventing uh, manual payment creation, so that was corrected. We fixed the hire date on the SSDT employee hire report that we have out there. Um, we want that to use the position hire date, so they, they corrected that to now be using that position hire date. Um, we fixed the bug that was, uh, there was a problem with the to date values on the employee dashboard that was corrected. Uh, there was another bug that was allowing archive compensations to be paid through the current payroll. So that was fixed as well. Um, we fixed the sorting of process payments. So when you go in, when you're processing your payroll and you're running process payments, we added uh, something that will now include the employee full name under the building district and the check distribution options. <coughs> We fixed a bug for direct deposits. Uh, when combining the payroll item, adjustments were not being included. Um, now a missed deduct tag is created for all deductions past the payroll item limit, which is a default of 24. So on the, uh, the, the uh, direct deposit, they'll see you know, anything past 24 will be a missed DED tag. Um, if a district created new contracts that included expenditure accounts that were changed on the USAS side, the account sync was failing to process the account transaction or transition. So the current code was assuming that every payroll account would have a parent account and a parent, uh, parent payroll accounts object, I'm sorry. And that wasn't true. So when, when they, um, the system, was unactivated, when they unactivated the accounts in USAS, uh, the new contracts, uh, that was, it was causing a problem. So they fixed that, they corrected that now, so yet they should no longer have errors or problems with the account information if they're adding those into new contracts. Uh, we fixed the bug in the lead projection submission. Uh, the message basically was changed from account does not exist to or or account does not exist or is not synced to use uh, no description found because before it was giving that message account does not exist or is not synced with USAS they changed that message to be use or no description is found that was what was causing the error there was no description found so basically that's why that other error was pr being produced so now we we create a more reasonable error explaining why it's erroring out. Uh, we fixed the lead balance query to return 0.00, .00 instead of null when there's no transaction found. <clears throat> we also fixed an issue in how lead projection was handling holidays. Uh, the system was charging the salary account and debiting the holiday account which is the opposite of what it should be doing. So we fixed it to make the salary accounts show negative values if non-zero. 
for both calamity and holidays, while separate leave accounts or the 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 separate leave accounts were then showing positive values. And that's how it should have been working. It wasn't working correctly. We fixed that. And then there was another. There was an error. It was a basically saying error value too long for type character varying varying four thousand. That was being produced on the employer distribution. Um, that was causing it basically was causing an audit event. So in reality, the pro the process was working. It was just the fact that um, behind the scenes the value was too long, so it just took longer. So in reality, the, it was actually processing. Um, so we fixed it so that error is not going to show up any longer because uh, the initial uh, time when it was given, you know, the error was told to us or given to us, basically the process was working and eventually they came back and said, oh, it's out there. Employer distribution, there were like three entries because they had tried it three times. It actually worked, but like I said, everything behind the scenes was causing an issue. So they just got rid of the error on, on the UI showing, showing that error to the, the user. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna talk about are the improvements and enhancements that were made to payroll. So on the 611 release, uh, there were some in, internal changes made to the query builder for the employer, employer retirement share report. Um, there were also internal changes made to a warning error to not allow non-production mode instances to process payroll. So both of those were fixed or enhanced on that 611 release. And also on the 611 release, they renamed the employee ID column on the SERS surcharge report to employee number instead. Um, on the 612 release, there were a lot of performance improvements made to like payroll report, posting of the payroll report, the, the direct deposit XML. Um, there, were, there were real big improvements made to the payroll account distribution detail projection and actual option. There was like a 90% improvement for that. There was a 90% improvement made to the budget distribution projection and actual report as well. The payroll item detail report, the projection and the actual option, there was a 61% improvement. And then the pay amount summary report, report there was a 43% improvement. <clears throat> and the, the outstanding payables user interface and the posting were also improved as well. On the 612.2 release, there was uh, an improvement for the query of gathering information necessary to post the payroll to USAS, which improved the load, loading times of the, pay, the post payroll to USAS detail view. So it kind of made that a lot faster. On 613, uh, again, we made some more performance enhancements, which were uh, uh, directed to the direct deposit PDF printing. There was an 85% improvement made to that. And then the payroll update modify option, there was a 50% improvement made to that. Um, for the outstanding payables reports, those were improved as well. The summary report, it was improved by 78%. And the detail re report was improved by 95%. We also improved, or we basically, I'm sorry, we didn't improve. We implemented a column filtering in the outstanding payables user interface to speed up the payables report grid. Column headers have been added to the first four tabs to the outstanding payables. So to all of your different tabs, like your uh, payee tab, uh, detail tab, all of those were improved. Uh, they were, they're all text-based columns for filtering. Uh, and so the performance really increased the, the, the runtime of the summary and the detail report as well. Um, one thing I'm going to show you that we did on the payroll item detail report. So let me just go ahead because I have a payroll started here. On the payroll item detail report, they actually added a, a tool tip to basically kind of help the, the user when they, when they process the payroll item detail report because 
a lot of users were a little confused. They're like, oh, I have to pull every item over to the selected. No, you don't have to do that. So we added this tool tip saying leave blank to select all payroll items. So that's a new kind of a new feature, something that we enhance. So it makes it a little easier for them to. And then the nice thing too, when they're over here, that same tool tip pops up. So they'll know that, you know, they don't have to select particular items. If they want to, sure they can, but they don't have to if they want to get all payroll items pulled on the report. Another enhancement that we made um, on the employee dashboard, let me pull up an employee here. On the employee dashboard, we added the employee number under the employee photo. Uh, that was an uh, enhancement request that was sent out and we actually made that correction or not correction, but we added it to make it a little bit nicer for the user to be able to find that. Um, on the 614 release, we uh, greatly reduced the timeout of the account sync. So um, earlier we had fixed it in the bug fixes, but then we actually, we fixed the timeout of that account sync. It basically went from three hours to 10 minutes. So that is a huge improvement. Um, another fix or another improvement we made was archived employees are no longer going to be included in EMIS reporting. So kind of, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, obviously you don't want archived employees showing up in EMIS reporting, but the only problem is if a district archives an employee that was in the current year, they should be really getting reported. So that could be a problem. But Overall, it's good because we don't want those other employees showing up on the report, the reporting, I should say. And we also made an improvement to the AFOR report. Uh, the, the fixes that they made made a 90%, 98% improvement on the processing of that report. Another thing we did on, we did this on the 614-1 release. We improved the performance of the employer retirement share report by about 98%. Um, on the 615 release, we added some new features. Uh, we added the electronic payment to the outstanding payables grid. So every option, all four of these options will, should, oops, hold on. If I click on the right thing, <laughs> I clicked on it again. What is wrong with me? There we go. New contract must be on my mind. Okay, so we've got payables by payee. You can see the electronic payment here. We've got payables by payroll item configuration. Again, electronic payment. Payables by payroll item. You can see the electronic payment there. And payables detail. Oops, hold on. You can see it there as well. So that was uh, an enhancement feature that we added to the outstanding payables. <clears throat> um, another thing that we did, um, we allowed uh, the payroll item configuration to be reportable on, on the grid. So if you're out in payroll item configuration, you'll now see that report feature or report option button available to use. You can create a report right here from that. Um, there were multiple, multiple enhancements made to the job calendar report. And some of those enhancements included adding a page break option and an exclude archive job calendars. You can see both of those options here. Uh, it will also now uh, print calendars without uh, days, so like we're talking your default calendar, it will now print those calendars out. Uh, one thing you have to remember, you have to include the beginning and ending days, and you'll see that those are required fields. And then if they do include archived job calendars on the report when they're processing it, those archived job calendars are going to be on the bottom of the report. 
making the selection between the non-archived and the archived a little bit easier. Uh, the job calendar selection is going to override the excluded archive job calendar flag, allowing the user to select both archived and non-archived if necessary. So when making the changes, um, those, those were basically all fixed internally. So you should be able to get anything you want now on your job calendars. I know a lot of times we had problems with you know, no default calendar being printed out. That was a huge problem. Should be able to get that now. Um, another thing that we enhanced was the lead balance report. They changed the column length. Lori. Make it a little bit. Yes. Uh, you have a chat um, from Rhonda oh, Brooks. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, um, District like okay. Electronic thank you. Thank you. So districts like the electronic payment column feature on payables processing. Southwood used it this morning and really liked it. Beautiful. We're so glad to hear that, Rhonda. That's, that's one thing we like to hear is good feedback. So glad to hear that. Um, let's see, where were we? Okay, um, we did add a patch to set all no electronic payment flags on payee defaults because there was an issue. Um, the payee flag, uh, the, the electronic payment flag was just blank, it was null. So we just added a patch to basically set that to false. Um, we made performance enhancements to the advanced reports. The position report was 55% improvement. The SDRS advance, um, not an advanced report, 58%. The SDRS report and submission was 59%. So we made pretty much enhancements to all four of the reports that, that are out there for the advance. And then we also improved the, the performance of the payroll posting to, by 80% as well. On the 616 release, we um, updated the employer retirement share to skip the SCRS or SCRS when a zero dollar amount is entered before you couldn't have a zero dollar amount. Let's just say you had SCRS set up at $25,000 and you had zero in STRS, it would not process. It was causing a problem. So we enhanced that, we fixed it. So now if a district wants to just run the SCRS retirement share, they can do it and leave the SCRS zero or vice versa, do STRS and leave SCRS zero it will now function correctly. Um, we be, we uh, enhanced the employer distribution report. I will show you, I made a screenshot of this and I'll give you, I'll show it to you if I can find it here. Here it is, okay. So basically what we did is we enhanced it by adding the uh, parameter, the setup parameters on the first page. And then at the bottom of the report, we added a summary for all of the different payroll codes, as well as the report totals. We also set it up. So let me just go back to it here. I'll go to the report itself. We set that up. Um, so you can process it in CSV as well as Excel format now. And then obviously we have the sort option or the subtotaling option now. Those are features that we can, you can use as well on that report. So they greatly improved that report, giving it a lot more uh, depth, a lot more information. Um, let's see what else we have here. Another option that we uh, added or made an improvement on is the employer distribution submission. We now allow for voided checks to be included. Before, when you were running employer distributions, the employer, or excuse me, the voided checks that were processed during or you know, that you want included on your employer distribution were not being included. So now, at the bottom of the employer distribution under USAS integration, you can see all of the different voided checks 
you could go in and say you wanted these two checks to be included. You could include those in your employer uh, distribution when you process. Another thing too, you'll notice, if I change this from voided to false, it gives me all this other information as well that wasn't, can be included. But normally it's gonna, you're probably just going to be using the true option to pull in voided checks. But I just wanted to let you know that that was available. On the 618 release, we improved the performance of the payee payments view. Um, the payee payments grid loaded many, it used to load a lot of abstract ledgers to do, to do like all the basic calculations and display the amounts of the grid. We changed that, we moved the calculations to a database. So it pretty much uh, eliminated a lot of the time that it was taking to get that information pulled in. Uh, we also added it on 619, we added a validation for the EMIS contractor, the CJ records for the, uh, the IRN, IRN field that was not validating previously, they corrected that. So now that field has to be populated in order to save a record. Um, if a payroll payment was voided or unvoided, the compensation warning for calculating properties and the, when you were basically uh, voiding or unvoiding was basically popping up, that error message was popping up. The errors are now being suppressed for the void and unvoid, so you should not see those errors any longer. They also, on the 619 release, added a module configuration organization role. Uh, that role is added to the group manager, or it was added to the group manager role. I shouldn't say. I shouldn't call it module configuration organization role. It's basically a property that's added to the group manager role. So if they have that role, if they have the group manager role, they're going to be able to access the account mapping, advanced sick leave configuration, check void message configuration, deferred absence posting configuration, EMIS reporting configuration, employee number automatic generation configuration, employer retirement share configuration, the ODJFS configuration, overtime object code configuration, payment printing configuration, STRS advanced configuration, and the transaction configuration, which we're gonna talk about in the new features. <laughs> so there's a lot of thing, a lot of configuration records that they now have access to. And on the 620 release, which will be today's release, uh, we have a couple of enhancements. The pay item code filter on payee payments grid was causing a, a, causing a massive performance issue if it was filtered on. Uh, the filter had to be remo must be removed until we can make underlying changes to the architecture in the query. So we basically removed that text box for filtering on the payroll item column for now. And like I said, until the architecture to fix this is in place. Um, we also fixed um, the option when, pr when processing direct deposit notifications, either the XML or the PDF option, that the LPA or LPE pay types will be combined into a single LPE pay type. So those are basically all of the enhancements and improvements we made. Now we get to talk about the fun stuff, which is the new features that we've added. So one new feature that we added um, is the STRS, S, the check STRS advanced report. So we were having some issues with the, it's basically like the CHK STRS report in classic. We had one out there, but there were some issues with it. So we created a new one called check STRS advanced. This report will give you like what employees were paid during the advance. This report, you can take that and compare to your STRS advance reports. If you have a problem with, you know, your STRS advance amount being over or under to try to figure out which employee is causing the problem. So this is your check STRS advance report under the canned reports.
Lori, is the other yeah. report going to be removed from the report manager? You know, I, I'm going to ask Mark about that, but I think it probably should be because because they were saying that there were problems with it, but I will definitely ask him about that because I noticed that too, Carrie, when I was going through everything for today, I'm like, oh, it's still out there. So yeah, I will definitely ask him about that. And um, I'll let you guys know, you know, what's going on as far as if we need to remove it or not. And then here, this is just the setup of the, of the report. So you know what it looks like. Um, another thing that we did is uh, we are going to uh, allow the SER surcharge report to be included in the payroll archive. You know, instead of your, your district having to run the report and then trying to save it somewhere and then trying to remember where they saved it, we actually created a bundle. So out under report bundles, you can see that the surcharge report is now out, out there. Let me find it. Where are you? It was there the other day. There it is. Gee, I couldn't see it. It's right here. SCRS surcharge. So basically, when they process the SCRS surcharge report, it's going to, to take that and put it out into the file archive as well. So that's going to now be out there for them to be able to go back and refer to when the when they get the report from SCRS saying you owe this much for surcharge and they wanted to do a comparison, they can do it. Um, another thing that we did in the pay rec import, we added the payee to name field because that was, it was requested. There's, there's a bank that was requiring it. So we added that in both the import and the extract option. So it's, it's available in both places now. Hold on, I can click on the right thing here. There it is, pay name two. Okay, um, another thing that we did was we changed the, the, the word error. We made it in red now on the pay report. So, so it kind of stands out a little better. Um, I'll show you a screenshot of what I'm referring to. Maybe, screenshot to come up, here we go. Pull it over here. Yeah. You can see now any errors are, are highlighted in red and it makes them stand out, makes it a little bit easier to read them. Okay, um, something else that we did is we're now including the organization name on all template reports. So anytime you run a template report under report manager, you will see the district name. So I'm just gonna go in quickly and run this birthday report. I'll just run it. There we go. We have dates in there. So now you can see that the, the name of the district is now included on the report. And this will be, like I said, every report that we have out there and under the templates will now display the, the name, the report name. Or the organization name, not report name, organization name, sorry. <laughs> um, another bundle that we have out there is for the SCRS advanced reports. So again, if you look at the report bundles, you can see that we have the SRS submission report archive. If I go in that, into that, if I open it, you can see this is going to include, oops, hold on. What did I click on? Advanced, okay. The, actually, there's, there's two. We've got the advanced reports, which is this. This is going to, to load the advanced fiscal year to date report, the position report, non advanced position, and uh, download file backup to the archive. But then when they actually create the submission file, there's an SCRS submission report archive that will also go out there as well. Hold on. No. What is that? 
Oh my gosh, I can't click on the right thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> so here's the uh, SSDT SCRS report. So like I said, when they do the submission, that report will get created and be put out on the, in the file archive. Okay, um, we added a new EMIS report to simulate data collections for employee and position. So if you go to the reports option, you'll see this EMIS reports feature. And again, you could process it for employee or you can process it for, for uh, the position records. We also created an expenditure account user interface in the use as integration uh, menu. You can see here we have expenditure accounts. Now, the expenditure accounts uh, UI will basically display all the expenditure accounts in, that are listed in payroll, what we have out there from USAS in payroll. Um, it allows for filtering, so you could filter, you know, if you were trying to find a particular account, it always sorts uh, by the eight account dimensions. It helps to narrow down uh, accounts that are synced and maybe not, not synced with USAS in a much user more user friendly way so this will allow you to see everything that we have in payroll and then you know you there's an account that was added in usas but it's not here maybe the accounts weren't synced you can find that information here very helpful and again this is a read only view so you can only you can read it only you can't do anything else but it's very helpful to when finding an account finding accounts Another feature that we added is an HSA ACH report. Uh, before, under the ACH submission for the HSAs, the only option we had out there was the submission option. Now we have the report option as well, just like we have for the ACH submission, which is a very nice feature. Something else that we did add is um, under new uh, contracts. So let me go out to new contracts. We have, you know, the districts now have the capability of locking in the paper period when activating new contracts. So if I wanted to activate all of these contracts, I could, you know, obviously check all the contracts, click activate, but you'll see here, we now have a lock in paper period option. So if it's checked, it's going to lock that paper period in for everybody that I'm going to be activating. Um, another feature that we added is we put the SCRS advanced configuration information on the organization screen. So if I go to organization, before you could only see it under the configuration SCRS advanced configuration record. Now you can actually see it under the organization screen itself. Lorraine, we have a nice little... chat message. Pardon? We have a chat. Oh, another chat message. Okay. Um, what is the advantage purpose of lock-in paper period? Uh, the lock-in paper period feature is basically used, it's like basically it's the override paper period on the compensation record. And a lot of districts are using it because they want the same dollar amount to be paid to the employee every pay like it did in classic. In the redesign, if that's unchecked, um, the paper period could vary by a few cents each time because the system does a calculation each payroll. So if the district wants, wants it to act like classic did, it wants that paper period to be the same throughout you know, the 20, 24 or 26 pays, they use that override flag or that lock-in paper period. So that's basically why they use it. You're welcome. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, on the nine or the nine on the six fifteen one release, we added the nine ten position code for the resource officer that was added. On the six sixteen release, uh, we added a couple of new properties. One of them is for um, the payroll accounts. We added what is called remaining, proper, or remaining property. So um, 
if you have a max set for a payroll account or a payroll item, we added a, a field to actually show what's remaining. So I'll go out to the payroll account first, payroll accounts first. And I'll just pull up an employee because it'll show under the payroll account. You'll see there, like here's a max, but then we have a new field that's called remaining max. So if someone has a max set, it's going to show you what is remaining for that max. And we also added that under the payroll item as well. And we did that for uh, employer and employee amounts as well. So let me go out to the payroll items and I will show you that. Um, one thing that I will tell you while we're getting to the payroll items is all of these um, remaining max options are available under the custom report creator. So you would be able to pull that data in if you, if you wanted to run a report or something just to find the remaining maxes. So down here we have, whoops, hold on, whoops, I gotta pull up a, an annuity. Here we go, pull up the wrong thing. So under the record of the employer max, you can see a remaining employer max amount. And we have the same thing under the employee max withholding. We have employee remaining employee max amount. So those fields are now available, which will be a really nice feature. And again, you can pull those into a report because all of those options are available under the custom report writer. Um, another thing that we added, I'll just go into a 450 record, is on the uh, retirement record, 450, uh, 591, 691, 400, 596, 90, we added, a fee, added a, basically a, a field for the fiscal year to date rehired retiree totals. So obviously the 450, we have the withholding, the employer amount, the uh, retiree gross, we have that information. And then on your 500 or 600 record, <coughs> let me pull up a 591, I'll just pull that up. You can see that it would just be for the withholding. So it'd be fiscal year date, retiree, retired retiree withholding. And then the 691, it would be the same, but it's employer withholding. You can see the fiscal day rehired retiree employer withholding. Same holds true for your 400, 590, and 690 records. My mouth is getting ahead of my brain. <laughs> um, the next thing we added, oh, you can now load mass load uh, accumulation transactions. So if I go to mass load, you can see there's an accumulation transaction entity out there. You can now mass load this. So if you have a spreadsheet that you want to load into accumulation, you can do that by using the mass load feature. Another really big thing is, well, not a really big thing for us, but for the auditors, we have a report out there now for them it's called AOS User Listing Report. It'll, it would give a listing of all the users for the district. And it's right, right down in the, in the uh, tra uh, template reports. So you can go in and process that. Um, on the 618 release, here's where we're talking about transaction configuration. We added a system configuration called transaction configuration for the highest check number that has been used for the district. So if I go to configuration and go down to transaction configuration, I, I would be able to see that highest check number or I have the capability of changing the highest check number if I need to. So that's a feature that we added that's, that's available to the districts. Um, another thing, and this is the one I'm real excited about, and you probably are too at the ITC level, we added a new audit report. 
I mean, it's not 100%, it's not the best, but it's a lot better that, than what we had before. So it allows you to basically select particular objects, not pull in every, every ounce of data that is, is out there for the audit. You can sort, you can pull it, you know, if you just wanted to pull it in by employee, you can do that. Or maybe you wanted the employee and their payment, you can do that. Um, you can just select a specific user, basically meaning whoever process, you know, whoever may have ran this. Um, if a district is trying to find out, you know, who made a change to somebody, you'd probably leave this blank and then it would show you all the users in the district that are, that have capability of making changes. Then we have that select operation, which is like delete, modify, add, or if you choose all, you'll get everything. And then select the sort option, whether you want to sort it by the date or by the username. So this is so much better. And it, the report even looks better. Let me just, let me try an employee. Let's just generate this. Oh, of course, I don't have a start date. <laughs> I got to do that. Um, let's do, this is test data, so I have no idea what is out here. So you can, well, well, you can see, we didn't make any changes in January to this test data. But again, like I said, this is, really helpful if you guys have already used it you'll know it's gonna it's a lot better than what we had and we are still going to be making changes to it uh d deep if you select employee can you select a specific employee um hold on let me go back to this i didn't uh no right now d i don't think you can because there's nowhere to there's no option to select an employee. I'm thinking that's one of the features that we're going to be adding as far as like, you know, selecting a particular employee. But for right now, I don't think we have that capability. Let me just, yeah, because we don't have those select boxes, you know, for employee or, yeah. Yeah, we don't have the capability of selecting a, just one individual employed like we did in Classic. Because Classic, that was huge. If you knew who the person was and you just wanted to run the, run the report, um, it made it a lot easier. But that is an enhancement request that we will uh, definitely do. Yep, Andrea said too, not at this time, have to search for the employee in the audit report. Yep, and that's, that's, that's what we were, that's what I was thinking. So we don't have that feature available, but it's coming. It'll be here, hopefully not too long down the road. Um, let's see, what else did we do? Um, at basically this last release, which is, will be today, um, we added a new uh, mass loading, another mass loading option. So let me go back to mass load. And it's going to allow you to mass load compensations. They can be updated or mass loaded, either one. So if you go to the entity, you'll see uh, the compensation option. So now you can actually mass load compensations, non-contract compensations, uh, legacy compensations can only be updated. You can update legacy comp compensations as well as your non-contracted contract. Um, you can load contract and non-contract compensations. So that's a really nice feature that we added and it's going to be, it's available. It will be available today, whenever our release comes out, which it may be already be out. I haven't been checking the mail. So um, other than that, that's everything we've got to this point to today. So does anybody have any other questions? Yep, and we do have a JIRA issue out there for that enhancement request for the audit report by, for the employee name. Um, it's JIRA issue, USPSR 5291, in case anyone wants to know that. Um, anybody else have any questions or concerns? If not, we appreciate everybody tuning in and you have a great weekend. And I've got a 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I got a two part, two, two questions. Um, one is, um, uh, Pat talked about in USAS of the setting a role for changing passwords and it almost looked like USPS had that, but I was trying it and it, they could look like they could change it, but they couldn't click the save. So is that not? I do not think that's available yet, Nancy. Um, let me write that down because I, you may have a gear issue out there just to enhance that. Change password. Okay. Yep, I will definitely check into that and let you know. But like you said, if the save option isn't available, it's probably not fully available yet. Right. Um, I have just, and I, sorry, this isn't the place to do this, but every, you know, I've got people on here, so it'd be good. <laughs> um, I've been getting <laughs> questions about the president's uh, yes. thing, and we've I didn't getting, know if. Yes, we've been getting those questions too, Nancy. And basically at this point, I will just tell everyone what I've been telling the two, the three tickets that I've had for this. We are checking into this because there's a lot of uh, a lot of things involved. Because first of all, this this payroll deferral is for Social Security and Medicare. Well, obviously, most school districts really don't withhold Social Security unless you have board members or something like that. And the other thing right now is this is set it's a deferral meaning that they are going to have to pay this back down the line and we're not we're just doing all of our track tra our tracking because we want like something from the irs or um the, the treasury of the state or the the not, not treasury of the state but the treasury department to tell us hey it's mandatory no it's not mandatory hey, they're gonna to have to pay it back. We don't know if they're gonna to have to pay it back. We wanna get all of our ducks in a row before we tell everyone, hey, do this or do that. Because I know September 1st is like the initial date to start, but we have, there's so many unanswered questions about this that we just wanna get all of the facts and tell everyone, you know, to tell them correctly before we have people start, you know, putting in stop dates and then having to keep track of, of what wasn't withheld and it's going to be it's and um i even went out yesterday and there are i've seen a couple different letters um that were sent to the like the treasury uh what's his name May, May, menangus or whatever his name is um they're basically letters sent to him saying you know we we have to have more definition we need to know what to do because this is going to cause such a hardship because if they're gonna to have to pay it back, first of all, it's gonna be a hardship for the employees. I mean, because after December, if they have to pay it back, districts, how are they gonna do it? Do you do it in one lump sum? Do you do it in um, multiple pays? I, there's just so many questions on how we're going to handle this. So um, at this point, that's where we're, we're at. We are checking into it. Mark and Matt are on the case. They're already looking into it, trying to find out what we're going to do. And like I said, in reality, for, for, for the people that we're servicing, it's really going to only affect the Medicare, if anything. So, but again, you still have to keep track. If we stop withholding it September 1 through December, we have, do we have to keep track of what wasn't, what, what was withheld but wasn't paid because they're not, not even withheld. Do we have to keep track of what should have been withheld and wasn't paid because they have to pay it back? We got to get all of that lined up before we, we give a de definitive answer on that. So hopefully that helps Nancy. I'm sorry I can't be you know more, more informative about it, but that's where we're at right now and we're just, you know, trying to get the best answer we could possibly get. Thank you. Appreciate it. No problem. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Um, we will talk to you soon. Everybody have a great weekend and thanks for tuning in.